the por- Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. Man, join us again for part two of the Hoop Dreams podcast. Is none other than I'm gonna call him a legend because he is Spencer Garrett. As you all know, <laughs> he's in that fantastic, amazing show on HBO called Winning Time that is really chronicling the 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 the, the life and the birth of what we know now as the LA Lakers. Spencer, thanks for doing halftime with us. But I, I want to start this out with you, man. Just um, how did you get the role of Chick Hearn? Well, good to see you guys again for part two of this. And thanks for not commenting on my weird mustache, which I'm growing for a play. <laughs> we haven't got to that yet. All right. Well, we can talk about the but That's a whole other podcast. That's a whole other hour. We'll do a whole hour on my mustache. Um, I got the gig. Uh, I auditioned for it probably with maybe 100 other guys. Um, you know, back in, I think, the summer of 2019, which seems a lifetime ago now, um, I got I got the call to come in and I, I heard that this project was out there in the wind. And I uh, and as soon as I saw that there was a chick Hearn, I said, I'm go- I got to get this. I got to get in there and I'm just going to go in and just just destroy it. And I had about three weeks to prepare. I went on YouTube. I watched everything I could find on chick. I tried to get his voice as close as I could possibly get it and his mannerisms and just try to get his vibe and just kind of get into his get into his body a little bit. And I walked in the room, I, uh, uh, the great casting director, Francine Maisler out here, she casts lots of major films and does all of Adam McKay's stuff. And I went in and uh, it was about 15 pages of dialogue. It was basically Chick calling a game. Mm. And uh, I just, I tried to have it memorized as best I could. And I, I found an old kind of vintage polyester suit with an old wide tie from the 1970s. And I went in dressed the part because I don't look anything like Chick, as you know, when you see the show, I'm covered in prosthetics with my nose and my hair and my ears. And so I went in trying to look and feel as much like Chick as I could. And uh, and I, I got the call, uh, got the call about a month later. And I was uh, I was on vacation with my girlfriend. We were overseas and I got a call from my agent. It was about four o'clock in the morning and I answered the phone and I was half asleep. And I said, dude, it's 4 a.m. here. I'll call you later. He's like, no, no, you're going to want to take this call. And I went outside the hotel. I went outside my room. I was in my I was in a hotel room and I went outside into the hallway and he's telling me, you got the gig. And I'm jumping up and down, holding my screams. And of course, I'd locked myself out of the hotel room (laughs) and I'm knocking my knocking on the door, waking my girlfriend up. She comes to the door. She's like, what, what's your problem? What's going on? What are you doing in the hallway? And I said, I got the job. And she screamed. And then her 10 year old son was in the other room sleeping and he wakes up and it was chaos. And, and, uh, but a, a good, a good celebratory day. And, um, and then we went into production about two or three months after that in the fall of 2019 and shot the pilot, Adam McKay directed it. And then, uh, we got shut down for COVID you know, and in the, in the spring of 2020. So we had to wait, we had to wait an entire year to, to, to go back up again. But uh, yeah, that's how I got it. I don't know how many guys auditioned for it, but I just had a feeling this was, this was, uh, this was mine. Uh, it just was just one of those feelings as an actor that I just was, I was going to go in there and just own it. And uh, it sounds, sounds like it worked out. Spencer, were you always a Lakers fan? Yeah, man. I grew up in, I grew up here in LA, grew up in Santa Monica. And uh, I grew up going to Lakers games. I remember going to see those Showtime games in 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 the seventies. I was about let's see, uh, I was about fourteen or fifteen in that era. And I remember going to those games and seeing Magic and Cooper and Worthy and Chick. And going to the Forum was like going to a rock concert. Wow! You'd go and you'd see you'd see Jack Nicholson or Rod Stewart or Diane Cannon. You'd see all these celebrities. It was like the vibe and the buzz in the Forum was like you you could hear the the building rumbling. It was just, and it seemed like, it seemed like they won all the time. Even when they, even when they lost, it just felt like it was such an electric environment that it seemed like they could never stop winning. And it was, uh, it was really an exciting time. So yeah, I was a total Laker head growing up as a kid. And then, uh, and then when I moved back to New York and, and uh, went to theater school, 
I tried to become a Knicks fan, but that's uh, that's a rough gig. That's a rough go. You know what's funny? It's all. It always seems to me like back in those in those uh, early '80s with the Lakers, it always it always seemed to me like they were like going to a movie a movie concert or a movie yes. entertainment. Yes. Like you know, what I'm saying just because yes. LA with the, you know that's where all the movies made and stuff like that. It seemed like the town had their yeah. team. You know, almost like, you know, we're putting on a show tonight. Like, it's an orchestra. Like, it's... It was a show. It was a show. I mean, you saw in that great episode where uh, where Gabby Hoffman, who's the... Uh, she runs the forum, and she's kind of presenting to Jerry Buss yeah. what, what, what it's going to be like with the Laker girls and the music. And it, it had an era... It had a vibe of a, of a rock concert, mm-hmm. uh, an aura, an aura of just uh, electricity. And that's when Jerry West, that's when Jer- Jerry West, <laughs> he's been on my brain. He's been on my mind. Jerry Buss, uh, Jerry Buss said, it's it's showtime. And uh, and that's, he coined, he coined the phrase, the Showtime Lakers. Beautiful. Beautiful. I think what's so amazing about this this show is on two levels. From one, if you're, if you're just a fan of movies, it's so entertaining. It draws you in. I love the direction of it. I mean, just... Even yeah. the cinematography of it, how they just give you that, you're in that 80s kind of vibe all the time. But I got to ask you, man, did you think when you all were shooting this, you had a hit? Did you think that this was like, man, this is going to captivate the world? You never know. You never know. But listen, when I saw what they were doing, the, the our DP, our director of photography, is a is a, a brilliant cat named Todd Von Hazel. And he's the he's the guy responsible for the look of the show. It looks like you're watching v- VHS footage <laughs> yeah. from the early '80s. Yeah. It looks like somebody popped a cassette into a into a VCR, and you're watching old old film footage. Uh, I I knew once they were going to incorporate that, and you got John C. Riley and Adrian Brody and Sally Field. Once they started putting this cast together, I thought, H- how how could this thing possibly uh, how could this thing possibly fail? It's got it's got too many spectacular elements to All it. All the layers and uh, just so such such layers to it, and the way these writers are are telling so many multi leveled stories at the same time. Right, right. Uh, it's uh, it's just so beautifully done, and every time I watch an episode, I kind of marvel. At like, how did they pull this off? Because it's really incredible, and the editing is extraordinary too. So, yeah, to answer your question, to answer your question, I didn't, I, mean, I didn't have any idea that it was going to be a hit. Uh, you, you hope, you hope that all your hard work is going to pay off, and people are going to dig it. But at the right. time, I just remember putting in those long hours and thinking, man, I, uh, we're we're doing something really special here. I think we're making something really special. And so now, when you when you see it every Sunday night. You see all of that hard work on on the screen. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's really kind of exquisite to watch, isn't it? Speaking, oh. yeah, it is. Speaking of pulling it off, uh, what was it like working along uh, alongside Adrian Brody? And had you guys ever worked together before? We never worked together before. We'd met a couple of times over the years. A um, lot of mutual friends, and he showed up on set. Uh, and we had our first scene together was the scene in episode three where I'm Chick is coloring his hair in his office mm-hmm. and uh, he's kind of singing in the mirror. And Pat Riley comes in and asks him for a job. Yeah. And I say to Pat Riley, I say, uh, go, go, go make me a voice tape. Right. But your voice is a little uh, your voice is a little uh, off. You need to work on your voice. Uh, you need to work on your voice and your diction a little bit. Yeah. So we. Uh, we, I sat in his trailer. We had all day, and we kind of bounced that scene around back and forth. Uh, he's such a sweet man and such a beautifully detailed actor. I was a fan of his for a long time, uh, and the attention to detail that he puts into each scene and 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 every performance, uh, every every scene that he's in in the in the show to me is perfection. The stuff that he does with Jason Segel as Paul Westhead is great. So yeah, we didn't know each other, but we became fast friends and yeah. we had, we had two great scenes together. Uh, the second, the, the fisting scene in episode five. And then we had, we sat next to each other all throughout all those basketball games. Uh, Cause when Chick, when, when Pat Riley becomes Chick Hearn's uh, color man, his sidekick, we sat there for 12, 14, 15 hours a day 
uh, getting to know each other. And uh, he's he's one of our he's one of our best actors, and he's uh, he brings such nuance and and subtlety and detail to this character. It's really uh, it's it's fun to watch as a fan and as an actor. I said to him. The night we wrapped, I said, I've learned so much from you. I really, uh, mm. I learned, I learned a lot. I try to learn something from every actor I work with, but particularly since I spent so much time with Adrian, I learned a lot from him. Now, looking at that guy, I would, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have picked him uh, to, to play Pat Riley just because of, of uh -huh. the looks. Now you say you have prosthetics and stuff like that put yeah, on you, yeah. but he actually becomes looks a little bit more like Pat Riley when he puts the hair on and, yeah, you know, it, it, he, right. he just has a distinguished uh, nose. You look at Riley, I was watching, uh, uh, you can see on my Instagram, there's a great interview. Uh, it's a, there's a little piece on Chick Hearn and, and Pat Riley is interviewed. Pat Riley had a, a kind of a, a prominent, you know, yeah, in a, yep. in a prominent. Uh, and, um, and so there's a, there's kind of a similar look and a similar vibe there. And, you see the slow progression of uh, he looks at he looks in the mirror and then you see that flashback to his father. His father had his hair slicked back. Um, yeah. Pat Riley's dad, and eventually, and then in, in that episode seven, I believe the mustache comes off, and you start to see this slow evolution of the look that we all associate with Pat Riley. Um, this kind of just a complete transformation, and it's so subtle and it's so kind of almost kind of thrown away and quiet the way he does it. So when you see him eventually in season two on the sidelines in the Armani suits and the slick back hair, mm -hmm. it's uh it there's a there's a confidence that you see that evolves in him. And um it's really it's 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 really a, a wonderful piece of acting. Yeah, he did a great job. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, I will say this, Spencer, and, and I just gotta say this. I do have some complaints about the show. Here's my first complaint. I hate waiting till Sunday. <laughs> me too. <laughs> and my second complaint, Man, you when it comes on Sunday. No, my yeah. second complaint is when it comes on Sunday, they make me wait till 8 o'clock at night. I, I I don't like that either, man. I, I You know, I just got so caught up with shows just you can go put yeah. it on to watch it because it, it captivates you that much that you just can't wait to see what happens because every Sunday they leave you with yeah. a cliffhanger. But a little cliffhanger. It's like yeah. it's like uh it's like it's almost I mean I don't know if you guys are fans of succession, but it's like it's almost like a family drama in a lot of ways. And there's a little bit of a cliffhanger. It leaves you you, you don't expect it from a show like this because I think a lot of people expected this was going to be a show about sports. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. about so much more than that. It's about family, it's about race, it's about class. And they and these guys, they're so masterful because they leave you with a little a little something right at the very end. You go, ah, wait, I got to wait till next week. Um, I'm lucky because I live in L.A. and I can watch the six o'clock because it comes on at six o'clock here on the Pacific time before and nine o'clock on the East Coast. So I get it at six o'clock. So I get to see it. I get to see it early, but hey, Spencer, I love to watch. I, I, I it's like almost like uh, uh a, a surprise gift every Sunday because I always look for new, new people who, you know, actors that I know, like, you know, I've seen on yeah. other things and I like to see who's playing who, uh, red Arbach, Mike. Chick. Oh man. Wow. Come on from the shield. Remember Come that? On. Oh yeah. Of course. I mean, from the shield. I mean, Michael Chiklis is another, I mean, another just beast of an actor. Yeah. This is a guy who years ago, before your time, he was on a show called The Commish, and he played this police commissioner, and he was this kind of like affable, charming, sort of doughy guy, and and he changed his, he kind of reinvented himself years later with The Shield, and he and he and he played this character that was 360 degree opposite of his character in The Commish. He was this hardened, sort of corrupt, this bad dude. Uh, he's such a wonderful actor and such a nice guy. And to see him as Red Auerbach with the sideburns and the cigar and everything, he becomes he becomes Red Auerbach in the flesh. Uh, I mean, I love the I love the scene in in uh, in the episode where where uh, Jerry Buss is up in the stands and you see at Auerbach down down on the floor when the Lakers are playing the Celtics, yeah. and because Auerbach is he's put them in the cheap seats, he's put these guys up in the rafters in these horrible seats, and you look and they look down and they see 
Auerbach, and he just kind of winks, winks yeah. at him like, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. how do you like your seats? He's yeah. so much fun. He's such a great dude. Every moment, there's always something that, that draws you in. But my question for you is, man, how much of this is just great casting? Because everybody looks like everybody. And how much of yeah. this is just, you know, the the prosthetics or the makeup? Because I'm just like, I'm looking at these folks and I'm going like, man, he looks like Magic. He looks <laughs> like Kareem. Like, how much of that is this just the casting of these guys? So much credit to the casting directors and the process that they went through to find the two anchors of the show. I mean, Magic and Kareem, you could, you, this show wouldn't be what it, what it is without, without Quincy and Solomon. If, if they hadn't found those two particular men to mm. play those two iconic roles, I can't wow. imagine that the show would be what it is. Um, they are so, they are so perfect and their performances are so perfect. Every time I watch Quincy, I go, God damn, this guy is so good. It, yeah. He, it just, his, not only does he does he capture the uh, the 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 smile and the electricity and the just the the sexy swagger that Magic had, but uh, there's a there's a soulfulness about him. And the scenes with his parents in Lansing, he's just it, it's just a beautiful actor. And then uh, and then Solomon uh, Solomon played for the Globetrotters for a bit, and mm -hmm. he has a doctorate. He was teaching education at Duke University. Um, wow. he's had a really interesting path. And so he's not as, he's not as, uh, seasoned an actor as Quincy was, but man, he's, his work is so, again, so simple and so quiet and subtle that, uh, you just go, I, how could you imagine any other actors in these roles? And then everybody else, obviously John C looks like Jerry Buss. Yeah. Uh, Gabby Hoffman looks like Claire Rothman. Uh, Michael Chiklis looks like Red Auerbach. So it's a, it's a combination of really, really brilliant casting and then a hair and makeup team that is just off the charts brilliant uh, with the wig work and the prosthetics. I wanted to look as much like Chick as I, as I possibly could, so they did a thing with me. Uh, it's called face mapping, where they put me in a chair and they surrounded me with a, a couple hundred cameras and that swirled around me to, to, to map the contours of my face. And they created this nose because Chick Hearn had this kind of beak of a nose that kind of drooped down into a point. Uh, and then he had very specific hair. So, I mean, I don't know how much I look like him in the final product on the show, but at least to me, I'm it gives me a sense that uh, that I'm I'm inhabiting another body. So I, I, I love what I love what the hair and makeup team has done uh, with every single actor across the board. I mean, Hadley, who plays Jeannie Buss. Uh, she's got some prosthetic work. I'm wearing uh, I'm wearing darkened contacts because Chick Hearn had dark brown eyes, so they made contacts for my eyes to turn my eyes from blue to brown. So the the attention to detail from from the hair and makeup team all the way across the board to the casting, it's just it's like, I mean, it's like we're making a feature film every week. Yeah, I, I bet I bet the cast. I mean, if you guys wasn't close when you first came together, you got close over over filming it. We did. I mean, there are there were days where I would only work sometimes make maybe one or two days uh, an episode. Um, so I'd work uh, I'd work I'd, I'd come in on a Wednesday or Thursday and I'd work uh, maybe a 14, 15 hour day and do all my sideline stuff. And then sometimes I wouldn't come back for another three weeks until the next episode. I would shoot out all my stuff in one day, uh, one or two days. So I wasn't around as much as the other guys were. There was a lot more bonding that was going on amongst mm. the other cast members who were there on a day to day basis. So I didn't have I didn't have the luxury of being able to spend as much time with these other guys. So I sort of became the kind of the the de facto mayor of the cast. And I kind of started putting <laughs> together cast dinners. In fact, Max Bornstein, our our showrunner, calls me the mayor of the mayor of winning time. Uh, and I started putting together cast dinners. Uh, at one of my favorite restaurants here in LA. And so we've done about, I'd say four of them so far. We're having another one on the seventh. Uh, we had a dinner with Adrian and Tracy Letts, who plays Jack McKinney and Solomon and, uh, and Quincy and Jason Siegel, just to kind of get to know each other and just to, just to hang out and, and be, to feel like we're a cast. Cause when you're, when you're a part of something this big, there are 22 
series regulars. They're like something like 20 cast members. You don't get to see each other all the time. So I was trying to kind of bring us together as a, as an ensemble and, and kind of create a little family atmosphere and, and, uh, and yeah, it's nice. It's a lot of fun. Now I got to jump into this because can't be Lakers without talking about basketball. I mean, there's more than basketball, but we're talking about basketball. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you this, man, I can't wait for the basketball scenes because they're so real and just like, I mean, could those guys wait till actually, Sunday? Who wait till Sunday? Uh, oh yeah. wow! Can they actually play, or is that just some great stuff, man? They can actually play. Several of them are really good, really good basketball players. And then for the stuff like, uh, for a lot of the dunking, uh, you they'll bring in. There's a there's a uh, an incredible incredible guy who does. He doubles uh, Dr. J, for example. So when you see Dr. J doing the reverse dunks and stuff like in the last episode. Um, that dude is a professional dunker and they bring him in. I mean, that's what he does. He's like, he is a professional dunker and, uh, and they bring him in to do all of those, all of those things. So in a lot of cases, you'll have, you'll have the actors on the court, bouncing up and down the court, dribbling. And then for stuff that's up close under the rim, they will swap them out for, uh, for a stunt double, for a basketball double, to do the more complex stuff. Because you don't want, God forbid, any one of these actors rolls an ankle or something. That's it. You know, you're done. So who's who's so, the Spencer uh, so, Gary double? Who you know who's doubling for Spencer Gary? When I, he do goes up and does it? I do my own stunts. I do your own stunts. I do when <laughs> when they when they need me to go and do a reverse dunk. You know, between the legs, behind yes. the back. Yes. <laughs> you know, high above the rim. That's all me. When you see that's that, you. Uh, that's. That's all me. I don't let anybody do my own. I don't want anybody to steal my thunder. So that's all my own stuff. I do I my own it. stunts, my own my own basketball work. So you yes. can you can make sure that's recorded. How much improvisation <laughs> was there allowed on set, or did you have to you know stick to the script? I like to stick to the script, but what, obviously when, when Chick had such a great flow with his dialogue, uh, and he's he's he never stops talking. So I would started I had started incorporating a lot of the Chickisms into the dialogue, <laughs> like the mustard is off the hot dog and all of those things. Uh, the jello is jiggling, the butter's getting hard, the eggs are cooling, the lights are out, all of that. Um, this game is in the refrigerator, folks. So I would I would kind of throw in some chickisms into the dialogue that was already written. So, I mean, I you have to. So yeah, they they allowed for some improv. They, they I think they kind of encouraged it, but obviously the the the, the writers write very specific dialogue, but for ch for the chick stuff, uh, they let me kind of play and and riff and 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 sometimes kind of go off and do my own thing, which is a lot of fun because because Chick it just kind of it was almost like stream of consciousness when you watch him call a basketball game he's talking nonstop and it's like uh, as as he says in the scene with Pat Riley it's like tongue. painting a picture <laughs> with your tongue which I love that line. Let me let me ask you this, Spencer. I mean, you worked with working with John C. Riley. I mean, he's known for some of the funniest. Movies of all time, Step Brothers, yes, Talladega Nights, and but those were more of your, I guess, your dramatic type comedies. Have you ever worked with him in these type of things before? I've never worked with John C. I've known him for a long time, but we've never worked together. I mean, this is a guy. If you look at his filmography, go to his IMDb when we get off the air. Um, I, I can't even count how many classic films he's been a part of. Uh, he's been around a long time. You know, he's done a lot of stuff with Martin Scorsese, uh, mm -hmm. dramatic stuff, comedic stuff. He's just he's a, he's he's one of our he's one of our greats. I mean, Boogie Nights, all the stuff with Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, I mean, you you start thinking you start thinking back. Oh, yeah, he was in that. Oh, yeah, he was in that, too. And he was in that and he was in that. He's been in so much iconic work uh, and you forget you think of him a lot in the in the Adam McKay stuff, Step Brothers, obviously, and. Talladega Nights and things like that, the comedic stuff, but but he's he's one of our greatest dramatic actors too. And this is what a great showcase for him in this because he he gets to do both in this. He gets to be charming and funny, and then there's the poignant stuff uh, with Jeannie and with his mom Sally Field. He gets to he gets to yes. Play oh, with I know, every I know he, in his tool I know kit. he is having fun like a kid in a candy store. Like you can see it, you can see it on the screen. You can see how much you can see how much fun he's having. So that's, I mean, that's when you, when you can watch an actor that you admire and you think that, you know, and you see 
you see how much fun they're having. Um, it, it, it comes through the screen and it, it, it transfers to you and you're enjoying it as much as, as you know, they are. And that's what, that's the mark of a terrific actor. I love watching him work. He, he, he plays Dr. Buss so well. I mean, he even got the, the half button shirt open with the gold chain. You know what I'm saying? It's all the way down to his belly button. Are you kidding me? He, He doesn't go halfway. He makes he makes Dr. Bus comes across like Dr. Bus was a big dreamer, like a, a an ambitious yeah. big dreamer, and he didn't mind yeah. rolling the dice, taking big risks. Yes, that's right, and that's 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 how the Lakers got to where they got in 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 the first year of his yeah uh, his, of his ownership of the team. He took over the team and they, and they won a title in his first year. Who does that? <laughs> Can you imagine how he was in that in holding that trophy? Like I can't believe this. He, he like, created a dynasty in in his first year. The beginnings of that dynasty. Uh, what what an incredible accomplishment! And then that's what the Showtime book covers from kind of seventy nine to eighty five. And you see this. You see this. Uh, this it just builds and builds and builds. And obviously, we're going to get into deeper into the rivalry with the Celtics. You see a little bit of uh, Larry Bird in the last episode. That actor, Sean Patrick Small, uh, so good as Larry Bird. Talk about talk about his likeness. Um, I mean, the the way they had even with the acne they put on him. I mean, it's 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 un, uncanny how much they make him look like Larry Bird. And he's so good. And he's got he's got skills. He can ball too. He's a really good ball player. I got I got to ask you this though, Spencer. And I actually got a two-part question for you. So when you're filming and you see all these wonderful actors and, and you're an amazing actor, do you ever like get like starstruck? Do you ever go like, oh, yeah. man, that's that's Sally Fields? Oh you yeah. Know? Oh yeah. <laughs> Every time. Every time. We talked about this a little bit last time. I mean, I've been doing this for 35 years, and I I've often said that the day that I pull onto a, a lot and walk into my trailer and feel like I'm bored with this or this isn't any fun anymore. That's uh-huh. when it's time to hang it up. I've been doing this for so long and there's never been a moment in my life, in my career where I have felt like I'm not thrilled to be there. Uh, wow. I love everything about it. You know, I've gotten to work with some terrific people, Harrison Ford, Glenn Close, Gary Oldman, uh, Julianne Moore, gosh, on and on. I've been so lucky. And I remember walking into the makeup trailer and looking over and seeing Sally Field and just going, come on, what is my life? This is silly. I'm, I mean, not starstruck, but you just think, gosh, how I just feel very fortunate to, to, to be in the ball game and to be a, at a, in a place in my life where uh, every once in a while you get, you get invited to sit at the grown-ups table and you get to be a part of something that's this special where every, every, person involved is at the top of their game and is a, is an A-list star and and they got there for a reason um and you get and you get to you get to work with them and uh, and experience what it was about them that that made you admire them i remember seeing sally field as a kid in movies like places from the heart and norma ray and such an iconic filmography and then all of a sudden she's sitting next to me 5 feet away in another chair and we're just gossiping about the day's events and politics and um it's uh it's really it's a thrill so yeah i get i get starstruck i try i try not to i try not to get giddy so i i uh i try to i try to be cool like oh yeah i hang out with sally field all the time you know my second question for you is man as as your career has evolved over the years and i want to get a little bit more technical the new social platforms have been introduced i mean can you talk a little bit about even for this show in particular and other movies you've done, the marketing strategy for a release and how your obligation is now uh, compared to back then. And I mean, just the other day you was on Twitter space. I mean, there was no Twitter space, you know, yesteryear yeah. and, you know, and, and now, you know, we're doing podcasts like crazy now, you know, even that is yeah. not a very long, you know, uh, process. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, social media is a funny thing, isn't it? It's gotten to the, point where I think for a long time, it was the thing that was kind of bringing us together um, with starting out with MySpace and then Facebook. And now there's so many things you can't keep track of them all. Um, And 
for me, Facebook was a it was a, a place to kind of reconnect with old friends and childhood friends and things like that. It's kind of turned into this whole other thing. I've always used it, uh, social media, as um, in lieu of a website, as a way to kind of say, hey, I, I'm I, I've got this film coming out, or I'm I'm doing a play next month in New York, and uh, and here's the information about the play. Um, but it does give you an opportunity to have to give you a little bit of a megaphone and to um, to talk about what you like and what you enjoy. That's the that's the upside of it. It it has a lot of downsides that we don't have to go into. But it um, it can it can be it can be a force for for ill as well as we've seen uh, in the last several years um, in this last kind of political cycle that we all lived through. So um, it's a it's a double edged sword, guys. Um, it's uh, it's as far as the show, it's great for promoting the show. And because uh, Chick Hearn is is a character that doesn't get uh, necessarily a lot of airtime out of the, you know, the, the 10 episodes or 20, 20 series regulars, there's 20 characters. So I get my little pops in here and there. So if I'm able to post a clip or uh, a, a scene from a show or uh, an interview like this, something like that. Um, it's fun to be able to talk about it. I love talking about the process, especially with guys like you, um, you know, talking about guys that 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 love films and filmmaking and and sports and all of that. So that's that's what I that's what I, that's my takeaway. I love being able to uh, to connect with people that uh, that I didn't know before and talk about talk about the show. Spence, what is your uh, process uh, going from theater? to TV and film. Um, um, do you do you prepare the same way for theater? Oh, yeah. you, does well, you go for a movie? Yeah, I mean, I'm sitting here before you guys uh jumped on. I'm uh I'm I'm in the process of doing a play right now in New York and there's an enormous amount of dialogue. So I literally have been locked in my house for the last 2 weeks just not not doing anything social, kind of trying to stay off social media checking in with friends and family from time to time. But I mean, my process is just learning the lines, learning the lines, learning the lines and trying to get, uh, and trying to find this character and who this character is. Um, it's, it's a similar thing with film and TV in a lot of cases with, uh, with, with TV, like we'll get the script, uh, for winning time a week, a week ahead of time or two weeks ahead of time. So you get like two weeks to kind of learn your lines and figure out what you're going to do. Um, in the case of the play that I'm doing, um, I've got two weeks to learn a, a 150 page script. And then we're going to, we're going to, we're in a rehearsal process where we've got two weeks to uh, put it up on its feet and then put it up in front of an audience for three weeks. So it's a much different thing. It's a much different, it's a much different, uh, it, it's a much different process in terms of uh, putting something on its feet like that. But in it's similar in a lot of ways in terms of the amount of, time and research that you put in and, and trying to, tr trying to, tr trying to figure out who the character is. Does that, I hope that answers your question. I'm, st I'm still trying to figure it out myself. So. No, it answered the question, but I want to ask you this though. Um, of course, just going back to content, are you a fan of the just dump it type of series where you can watch them from eight or 10 episodes, the way you see a lot of streaming services now, or do you like the way that winning time is being every Sunday? I think I think it uh, it varies from show to show for me. I like if I wasn't on this show, I would like uh, how they kind of feed it out to you over the course of over the course of ten weeks. Uh, I like being able to be on the edge of my seat. Um, it's we 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 live in this kind of fast food culture now, where uh, we can we can consume an entire an entire series in two days if we want to. I got I got turned on to the show Yellowstone with Kevin Costner. I watched all four seasons in three days. Um, <laughs> I, I binged it all. I mean, that was that was fun to do. I got I was sort of late to the party with it, so I was kind of getting caught up. But for shows like this, shows like Succession, certain things. I remember when The Sopranos was on. I couldn't wait till the next week until the next episode came out. So I guess I guess it depends. But I think there's something to there's something to being patient, having the audience be patient and giving you a little, a little taste. And then, Oh, we're going to see Jack McKinney, uh, wipe out on his bike, you know, and God, Oh my God, what happened? He's on his bike. What's, is he dead? What's happening? 
And then, oh, well, we're not gonna we're not gonna tell you right away. We're gonna make you wait seven days, so you have to tune in next time. That's mm -hmm. that's the old way of doing things. I kind of like that. I believe that way slowly brings on more people who maybe was interested in the show, but maybe having that time to yeah. watch. So that week and everyone's talking about it around them, like, man, did you see the last episode? Right. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So it, it opens that up, you know, to get that more, right. more people in, I think. That's right. You know, showing it every, right. you know, I mean, showing it every two days or like, you know, real quick, like people will think like it's, it's so popular that it's, it's, it's not, oh, I catch it on, you know, on DVR yeah. or something. You know, I catch yeah. it later. But to do it over... And the viewership has grown. The viewership of, of Winning Time has grown and grown exponentially over the last eight weeks. So that's what we like. That's what we like to see. I mean, it, the, the anticipation builds and and people are talking about it for for whatever reasons. I mean, whether it's whether it's the last episode or... Uh, you know, the, the Jerry West controversy, whatever it's, it's making people go, Oh, what is this thing we're talking about? I like that. I like that. Spence, uh, do you also know how long it took Adam McKay to even come up with this story and how long it maybe sat before he even brought it to studios? Well, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't McKay's, uh, it initially started with, uh, uh, one of our writers and, uh, and exec producers, uh, Jim Hecht, who, uh, optioned the property of Jeff Perlman's Showtime book. Uh, he went to Jeff Perlman many years ago with with uh, Showtime and said, "I have this idea of turning Showtime into um, uh, into like uh, True Detective." Uh, Damn, do you remember True Detective? Yeah, you know, with with M McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. I wanted I wanted to serialize this book and turn it into kind of a, a, a suspenseful show that has an arc. And wow. So all credit to Jim. I mean, Jim bought Showtime several years ago, uh, optioned it. It 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 went to McKay. McKay loved the idea, and then it was a long gestating period. It took it took several years. I think it was something like ten years in the making. These Damn. things don't happen overnight, and so yeah, it was a long time. It was a long time happening to go from a a a book about sports, about a a sports dynasty that takes place over five years. Jim Hecht had the, the 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 foresight to say, "Wow, this could be a really interesting dramatic series." Um, who's the guy to call? Well, he goes to Adam McKay, and then and they turn it into this magic thing that we have right now. I gotta ask you this, Spencer. I gotta ask you this, man. Ag and I, we are competitors, and I'm yeah. wondering, is it like that in the acting field? Do you all get in there and get? competitive with each other and and if so man what's your competitive nature like i mean not not on set uh but certainly coming up there were i i would go and audition for a guest spot on a television show or a movie and i would go in most of the time in the last 25 30 years i would walk in the room and i would see the same 8 10 guys the same 8 10 12 Guys, we all know each other. We all like each other. We're all friends. We're all completely different types of actors. But I was seeing the same dudes in the room competing for the same parts. So it's, I mean, the acting community is a funny thing. It's a very supportive, it can be very, it can be very competitive. Yeah, but it's also very supportive. It's a tribe and, um, and we support each other. So, uh, the guy that's going in to, to audition into the room right before me, you say, good luck, man, break a leg. Um, you know, you wish that person well. You want the best person to get the job. Whenever I don't get a job and I find out that it's a buddy of mine or somebody, somebody, even if it's somebody that I don't know that booked the gig, you go, I hope they, I hope they crush it. I hope they do a great job. Because if you don't get the gig, you want the person that you lost the job to to do a, a, a wonderful job. That's just, I mean, that's, that's just me, but, um, so it's, there's a sense of competitiveness. Sure. Um, I've walked in the room and I've seen a guy sitting, sitting in the chair. He'll, he'll stand up and say, Oh, Spencer Garrett's here. I might as well leave kind of jokingly. And I've been that guy too. I mean, I've been, I've been the guy sitting in the chair and I'll see Joe walk in the room. I go, Oh shit, Joe's here. Bye everybody. Um, cause sometimes you just know that, that that's the guy. Oh, he's the guy. He's more right for this gig than I am. I gotta throw this at you. 
And AG can yeah. attest to this. There have been games we played, we lost, and we said, man, we shouldn't have lost to them. Has there ever been a yeah. moment where you yeah. said, man, I would have killed that part? I'm gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say what what those jobs are, but sure. I mean, sure. I've watched things that I that I lost many times. I've lost. I've watched things that I that I uh, that slipped through the cracks. Uh, that 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 got by me. That somebody else booked, and I'd be watching. I go, God damn! I would have. I would have just destroyed that. Um, I mean, what it could have, shoulda. It is what it is. It's a it's a competitive business. It's like. I mean, it's like it's like sports. It's a it's a different sport. Besides the the theater stuff that you're working on right now, what is the next chapter in Spencer Garrett's hoop dream? Listen, I'd like my hoop dream is to take this uh, this hoop show uh, to its completion. I'd love to the, the the book takes place over five six years. I I I would hope that we could get three or four seasons out of it. That's my dream. Um, you never know what's going to happen in Hollywood, but as long as as long as this writing keeps at, at its pace and the acting keeps being top notch. Uh, I, I can, I can see this going for, you know, three or four seasons. I hope that's my dream. And then, and then after this, after this show is over, who knows? I mean, I'm, uh, uh, I, I love, I love being in the game and, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for the next challenge. So, uh, my, my, my hoop dream is that we keep getting to play this, this game of hoops with this audience and with this show. And then after that, who knows, man, I'm just on God's good humor. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, Spencer Garrett. He's closed the door on the refrigerator. The microwave is over. The coffee is burning and it's in the cup. He's out, ladies and gentlemen. This game is in the refrigerator. The lights are out, the door is closed, the butter's getting hard, the eggs are cooling, and the jello is jiggling. I'm the gold of my era. I've been a trending topic. I'm as fly as a feather. My pocket's macroscopic. See, with time, I get better. I'm always in the action, kid. Know I got it locked from Chicago where the toughest live. Concrete jungle, earn my stripes on the pavement there. You make it here, then you can make it anywhere. No comparison. Your game is embarrassing. No one can touch me. I'm all but going there again. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha Agee. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha Agee. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. I'm a hoop Dreams the Podcast, an Unlearning Network production. Written and produced by Arthur Agee, Will Gates, Matt Hoffer, with audio engineering from Matt Savage. For more episodes, check us out at www.unlearningnetwork.com. Gotta be a dog to survive in this cold weather. Ice in my veins, no need for a warm sweater. I'm coming for it all, best believe I won't let up, yeah. Hey, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha Agee. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm balling like I'm Martha Agee. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me.